Henry VIII is one of England's most famous kings, known for his love of feasting, getting married and chopping people's heads off in that order. Henry oversaw some of the most dramatic changes in England's history. Chief of these was his break with the Catholic Church and the launch of the English Reformation. But it's not just his policies that have caught people's interest. Henry's love life was just as juicy as his reign, and his six wives are renowned all over the world. Their history has been told and retold over and over again in television, film, and a rather fun musical, Live in Consort. Divorced, beheaded, and died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. So the rhyme goes. These six fascinating women served as queens of England through times of intense change and with a famously difficult king beside them. Each of their stories tell us a lot about both Henry VIII and England at the time, and they're so full of gossip, intrigue, and downright outrageous moments that we can't seem to look away. Before we get into it, if you've got a question about the reign of Henry VIII, drop us a comment and we might make another Tudor video. And don't forget to like and subscribe our channel too. So, in three Catherines, two Annes and one Jane, this is the history of Henry VIII's six wives. The tale starts with Catherine of Aragon, a red-headed princess born to two of the most famous and powerful rulers of the early modern world, Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon, the Catholic monarchs of Spain. At the dawn of the 16th century, Spain was on its way to becoming the most powerful state in Europe, thanks to Isabella and Ferdinand's relentless pursuit of power and piety. In 1492 alone, the powerful couple had set forth a number of astonishing events that had an incalculably great impact on the course of history. They had conquered Granada, shockingly expelled the Jews from Spain, and signed a contract with one Christopher Columbus to find the Indies, and the rest is history. They saw advantageous marriages for their five children, forging royal alliances for the long-term benefit of Spain. In 1500, England was not one of the great European powers, so it was in their interest to form a strong alliance with Spain, particularly in the face of their long-time enemy, the powerful France. So, in 1501, at the age of 15, Catherine of Aragon found herself sailing to England to marry the heir to the Tudor throne. But this wasn't the future Henry VIII. Catherine actually walked down the aisle of Old St Paul's Cathedral with his older brother Arthur, a gentle boy of 15, who had written to her many times in the years leading up to their marriage. But the marriage would be short-lived. Just six months later, the couple came down with a mysterious disease known as the sweating sickness. Catherine survived, but sadly, Arthur didn't. He died on the 2nd of April, 1502, and Catherine was left a widow. What's worse, she found herself trapped in England for the next seven years, while her father and Henry VII squabbled over what to do with her, and her huge dowry. Eventually, a solution was reached. The second Tudor son, Prince Henry, stepped up to the plate and married his brother's widow. That's going to be a key plot point a bit later on. So while the court waited for the teenage Henry to age up a bit before the wedding, Catherine acted as Spanish ambassador to England and was the first female ambassador in European history. In 1509, they were finally crowned King and Queen of England, and it looked like everything was going to come up roses. And for a long time, it did. Catherine excelled as Queen, and even served as the country's regent whilst Henry was away fighting in France in 1513. During this time, England won a significant clash against Scotland at the Battle of Flodden, where the Scottish King James IV was killed. Catherine sent Henry a piece of his bloodied coat as a trophy. She wrote that she wished to send James's actual body, but our Englishmen's hearts would not suffer it. But sadly, all was not triumph in Catherine's reign. She suffered at least five miscarriages and stillbirths, including the king's first child, a boy, who only lived 52 days. In 1516, she gave birth to her only child to survive to adulthood, a daughter, Mary, who went on to become queen as Mary I, often known as Bloody Mary, but that's another story. All in all, Catherine of Aragon was married to the king for 24 years, from June 1509 to May 1533. That's longer than all the other wives combined. Yet Henry grew restless for a male heir, and his wandering eyes would change England forever. Enter Anne Boleyn. 
Anne was one of Catherine's ladies-in-waiting, known for her quick wit, fashion sense and charisma. Anne had spent much of her childhood in the foreign courts of Europe due to her father's diplomatic career, and she returned as a dazzling courtier. She caught Henry's eye around the year 1526, setting into motion a chain of events that would not only lead to the end of Henry and Catherine's marriage, but also kickstart the English Reformation. Pretty huge. When the beguiling Anne refused to become only the king's mistress, as her sister before her had been, Henry launched an unwavering crusade to end his marriage to Catherine. This was known as the King's Great Matter. He argued that his marriage had been invalid because of Catherine's previous marriage to his brother, and this was why they had been cursed with no living sons. The devout Catherine rejected this, saying that the marriage had never been consummated, and in a letter to Henry she damningly referred to Anne as the scandal of Christendom and a disgrace to you. The Pope refused to grant the annulment, and in response, the King assumed supremacy over religious matters. He turned his back on the Catholic Church, and the English Reformation began. The Protestant Reformation had been stirring in Europe for years before Henry's break with Rome. Its origins lie with Martin Luther, a German friar who began to protest, quite loudly, the abuses of the Catholic Church. In 1516, when a friar came knocking around Wittenberg selling indulgences to its peasants in order to fund the grand reconstruction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, Martin Luther snapped. He laid out all his fury against Rome in a tract known as the 95 Theses, with the popular story stating that he nailed it to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg. And it was scathing. In one tract, he asked, why does the Pope, whose wealth today is greater than the wealth of the richest Crassus, build the Basilica of St. Peter with the money of the poor believers rather than with his own money? To publicly say that about God's anointed messenger on earth was pretty outrageous. And the Catholic Church were fuming about it. But it was about to get a lot worse for them because the 95 Theses spread like wildfire through Germany. Aided by Johannes Gutenberg's newly invented printing press, by 1519, they'd also reached France, England, and Italy, during which time the term Lutheranism first came into use. At this time, Anne Boleyn was living at the French court, as she had been for most of her childhood. Likely influenced by reformers on the continent, when she returned to England in 1522, she is thought to have brought some Lutheran sensibilities with her. One contemporary source tells us that she alerted Henry VIII to a certain heretical pamphlet which cried out for monarchs to limit the corrupting power of the Catholic Church. So that may have given him a few ideas. So back to 1533, and Henry had broken with Rome, becoming head of his own church in England. On one side he had the devoutly Catholic Catherine, and on the other was the forward-thinking Anne, who represented a new England with Henry in the driving seat. Rather quickly, everything leapt forward into this new England. Henry and Catherine's marriage was declared illegal and she was banished from court, forbidden from seeing her daughter Mary again. Not cool, Henry. Not cool. Now came the time for Anne to cement her place as queen. Even before his marriage to Catherine was officially annulled, Henry married Anne in a secret ceremony in November 1532 and again in January 1533, just to seal the deal. This marriage was declared good and valid by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, in May, and wasting no time at all, Anne was crowned Queen of England on the 1st of June, 1533, in a glorious ceremony at Westminster Abbey. So, after their long seven-year courtship, Anne was on the throne at last, and all that hard work was worth it. Being excommunicated by the Pope, having some of Henry's closest advisers beheaded, dissolving the monasteries and uprooting one of England's most powerful institutions, all worth it. Happily ever after, for a while. After the cataclysmic separation from Catherine and the Pope, who also just happened to be her nephew, relations with Spain had plummeted. In contrast, Anne's many years at the French court helped foster a well-needed friendship with England and France. Within her fashionable court, she had an excellent relationship with the French ambassador, and that's never a bad thing when you're practically on each other's doorstep. So Anne brought intellect, fashion, and new alliances to Henry's court. But there was still one big issue on the table. In September 1533, 
and gave birth to the long-awaited royal baby. But to Henry's disappointment, it was a girl. That girl would grow up to become one of the greatest monarchs Britain has ever seen in Elizabeth I. But to Henry, she was just another daughter. After Elizabeth, Anne would suffer two miscarriages. Like Catherine, she seemed unable to bear Henry a son. And for years, historians have tried to work out why. Childbirth in the 16th century was a hazardous business, even for royals. One in 20 women in Tudor England died in childbirth, and we only need to look to Henry VIII's third wife, Jane Seymour, to see evidence of this. But it wasn't just dangerous for the mothers. It's also reported that only two out of every five babies born would live to adulthood. Many women lost babies before and after coming to term, and for Queens of England, this wasn't just a personal tragedy, but also a potential political crisis. If a queen couldn't provide a male heir, it was her fault in the eyes of the state. In Catherine of Aragon's case, Henry started to believe he had been cursed for marrying his brother's wife. As stated in the book of Leviticus, if a man shall take his brother's wife, they shall be childless. Well, there are some scientific theories for why both Catherine and Anne Boleyn suffered so many failed pregnancies. Henry himself, unwittingly, may have been the cause. Of all the legitimate pregnancies attributed to the king and his first three wives, 70% resulted in miscarriage or stillbirth. This is compared to only 10% found in the nobleman closely associated with him. Some studies suggest that Henry was positive for the Kell blood group, meaning that if Catherine and Anne were Kell negative, they may suffer multiple miscarriages and the death of Kell positive fetuses after their first pregnancy. There are other suggestions that hint to diet as a contributing factor. The devoutly religious Catherine was known to fast regularly while pregnant, which may have inadvertently harmed the unborn child. Similarly, as time went on, the stress of struggling to provide a male heir would have taken its toll. History often tells of one vital instance in which this doomed Anne Boleyn. In January 1536, she was pregnant again, but this month saw more drama than most. On the 8th, News of Catherine of Aragon's death reached Anne and the King. They were overjoyed, reportedly both wearing yellow in celebration. Yet, as one of Anne's rivals fell, another emerged. At some point that month, the King set his eyes on Jane Seymour, and in classic Henry style, she was one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting. Anne was fiercely jealous and more unaccepting of Henry's cheating than her predecessor. On one occasion that month, she noticed Jane gazing into a locket given to her by Henry and ripped it from her neck so hard that she drew blood. While Anne's fury grew, Henry suffered a serious jousting accident on the 24th of January and was knocked unconscious for two hours. He eventually came back around, though some historians have since suggested whether the brain damage he suffered had an impact on his already tumultuous moods. Five days later, possibly caused by stress, Anne miscarried a son. The scathing Spanish ambassador Eustace Chapois wrote, she has miscarried of her saviour. And indeed, Henry's patience had worn thin. There are a number of theories as to how Anne's downfall came about. Some think it was organised by Henry's right-hand man, Thomas Cromwell, to destroy her influence. Others believe it was set up by the king to quickly do away with Anne and have a son by Jane. Natalie Gruninger came on the podcast to give her views on Henry's involvement. He pursued her death with the same kind of vigour that he'd pursued to marry her. So I don't think that he thought she was guilty of having, you know, multiple affairs with five different men that went for 27 months, but no one noticed somehow. But I do think that he felt that she had betrayed him and that she was deserving of that ultimate punishment. Whatever the motivation, Anne went from Queen of England to executed in the space of three weeks. On May Day 1536, she was arrested and taken to the Tower of London. The charges against her, now widely understood to be false, included high treason and adultery with five different men, including incest with her brother George. After what was essentially a show trial, Anne was found guilty, as were the other five accused. When the morning of the 19th of May arrived, however, she was apparently light-hearted. Discussing the skill of her specially hired swordsman with Constable William Kingston, she joked, I heard say the executioner was very good, 
and I have a little neck, wrapping her hands around it with laughter. Eyewitness accounts from the execution say that she held herself with courage, delivering a speech that brought the audience to tears. She implored that, if any person will meddle of my cause, I desire them to judge the best, effectively declaring her innocence and moving most historians who do meddle to believe her. After the tempestuous Anne, Jane Seymour provided a calming presence to Henry and is commonly thought to have been his favourite wife. Jane was not as educated as either of her predecessors, but her gentle personality reportedly lent itself to peacemaking efforts at court. Ironic given that she was married to Henry just 10 days after Anne had been beheaded. Jane would rule as Queen of England from May 1536 to October 1537. During her short reign, she is attributed with reconciling Henry to his first daughter Mary and most famously for giving birth to the long-awaited heir to the throne in October 1537. He would grow up to be King Edward VI, but she wouldn't live to see this. After developing postnatal complications, she died less than two weeks after his birth, aged 29. Jane was the only one of Henry's wives to be given a Queen's funeral, at which Princess Mary acted as chief mourner. She was buried at St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, where Henry himself would choose to be buried after his death in January 1547. With Jane's tragic passing, the throne beside Henry was, for the first time in decades, left empty. And so, Thomas Cromwell was sent abroad in search of a beautiful new Queen of England. Here, Anne of Cleves entered the stage, ruling as Queen from January to July of 1540. Anne was a German princess whose marriage to Henry was as much about politics as it was about personal dynamics. Her brother William was Duke of Ulick Klebsburg and bore the rather promising epithet, the rich. Her brother-in-law, John Frederick, Elector of Saxony, was also head of the Schmaldick League, a powerful Protestant military force. Henry thought he'd be able to tap into this resource by marrying Anne, but the long and short of that was... he thought wrong. Anyway. He married Anne in January 1540, only to have the marriage annulled just six months later, citing its lack of consummation. Henry blamed this on Anne's appearance, and her nickname, the Flanders Mare, would become famous across the ages. But did Henry really call her this? Let's see what Susanna Lipscomb has to say. Well, one thing is for certain. He never called her a Flanders Mare. That expression was coined in the 18th century. Well, there you go. In fact, Heather R. Darcy believes the annulment had much more to do with shady politics. That's what I think went wrong for Anna's marriage to Henry was that Anna's brother was sneaking behind Henry's back and not telling him his plans. So, despite him calling her some pretty foul things in their annulment proceedings, these occurred six months after her marriage and may have been trumped up to ensure that it actually went through. The pair actually ended up being close friends. Anne essentially became an honorary member of the royal family, known as the King's Beloved Sister. And she didn't do bad financially either. Her generous settlement included Richmond Palace and Hever Castle, the childhood home of Anne Boleyn. The man who arranged their doomed marriage did not fare so well, however. Thomas Cromwell was executed on the 20th of July 1540, the same day that Henry married his next wife. Number 5. Catherine Howard, a queen whose tragically premature end has captured public interest for centuries. She ruled from July 1540 to November 1541, and her marriage to the king came close to matching the drama of his earlier partnerships. Perhaps unsurprising given that she belonged to the same family as Anne Boleyn. They unfortunately shared this nasty piece of work as an uncle, Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk. But Catherine's life had been turbulent even before Henry came on the scene. As one of the many wards of her father's stepmother, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, she began to be involved in repeated sexual contact with her music teacher, Henry Mannix, when she was as young as 13. Later, Catherine also became embroiled in an extramarital affair with the Dowager's secretary, Francis Derham. These relationships have often been scrutinised by historians. Here's what Gareth Russell believes. I wouldn't categorise the relationships as physically abusive in the way that we have been discussing recently, but I do think that these were two monumentally unpleasant people and that there was a really dark dynamic to those two relationships. 
After the Dowager Duchess found out, Catherine was sent to court to serve as a lady-in-waiting to Anne of Cleves. This position had been secured for her by her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, who saw an opportunity in Henry's lack of interest in Anne. The pair were married in 1540. By this time, Henry was 49, bloated and in pain from an ulcer on his leg that would not heal. Catherine, on the other hand, was around 17. In the spring of the following year, Catherine is alleged to have begun an affair with a favourite courtier of Henry's named Thomas Culpepper. She and Culpepper had a romance even before Henry had set his sights on her, but Culpepper had since moved on to someone else. Well, after they reunited, their meetings were organised by Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, the widow of Anne Boleyn's brother George and close friend of the Queen. It's uncertain as to whether Catherine and Culpepper actually slept together, but nevertheless, by autumn 1541, the cat was out of the bag. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, learned of her previous relationship with Derham, and soon after, her alleged affair with Culpepper came to light when a love letter written by the Queen was found in his room. He launched an investigation into Catherine's alleged affairs, and she was detained and questioned by Cranmer himself in November 1541. Terrified and clumsily retracting and retelling her version of events, the young Catherine unwittingly doomed herself in these interviews, as Cranmer compiled his damning report. Both Culpepper and Durham were executed for high treason that December. So, at this point, I'm sure you've picked up that Henry VIII had a habit of executing people left, right and centre. It's thought that over his 36-year reign, he had up to 57,000 people executed. From his closest advisers to those who refused to accept him as supreme head of the church, if you upset the king, your head could very well have been on the block. And Henry was not averse to inventing new laws to make sure you ended up there. In the case of Paul Catherine Howard, one new law was passed that made it treasonous not to disclose premarital sexual relations to the monarch, and another to incite a person to engage in adultery as the queen consort. During this time, Jane Boleyn suffered a serious mental breakdown and was deemed insane, a state that usually protected someone from execution. Well, Henry reversed that too, performing a number of legal acrobatics to ensure that everyone involved would be served the most severe punishment possible, death. He is likely the most blood-soaked monarch in British history and the nearest thing we've had to a 20th century dictator. Catherine received no formal trial. On the 13th of February, 1532, she was executed for high treason, likely aged around 19. On her doomed route by barge to the Tower of London, she would have passed under the impaled heads of her reported lovers, Culpepper and Derham, as she went under London Bridge. Lady Rochford was also executed, and both were buried in unmarked graves at the Tower's parish chapel, alongside their family members, Anne and George Boleyn. Let's see what Gareth Russell had to say on that. Yes, it was extreme foolishness, but also it says more about where the Henrician state was by 1541 to 1542, that something that foolish was transmogrified into something that monstrous. So, for the final time in his reign, Henry was once again in search of a wife. And here is where our tale concludes. Catherine Parr who ruled from July 1543 to January 1547, and was not only Henry's companion, but a scholar and a writer. Despite already being in love with Thomas Seymour, Jane Seymour's brother, Catherine soon caught King Henry's eye and considered it her duty to marry him instead. And at this point, who would dare refuse him? They wed in July 1543, just four months after Catherine Howard was beheaded. Parr had been married twice before, being titled Lady Burr and then Lady Latimer, and married again around six months after Henry died, making her the most married English queen in history. This is not Catherine's only claim to fame. She was a prolific writer and is often credited as the first woman to publish work in her own name with her prayers and meditations in 1545. This was very successful amongst English readers in the 16th century, helping to develop the new Church of England. Indeed, Dr. Micheline White suggests that much of Parr's work was written in collaboration with Henry VIII for the purpose of the state. She was part of the machinery of the crown and that she was doing important things to advance the crown's agenda. She's 
an author and that Henry is promoting her and enabling her and wanting her to be working for him. But she wasn't always in Henry's good graces. Though raised a Catholic, in adulthood, Catherine clearly harboured a number of reformative religious views, as seen in her writing. Henry soon grew agitated by her insistence on debating religion with him, and as usual, there were some sly characters waiting in the wings to unseat her. Anti-Protestant officials such as Stephen Gardiner and Lord Ridesley attempted to turn the king against Catherine, and an arrest warrant was eventually drawn up. A soldier was actually sent out to arrest her when she was walking with the king, yet he was sent away. She had succeeded in saving her own neck by artfully reconciling with Henry. During her queenship, Catherine also established very close relationships with the king's children. Elizabeth in particular formed a very close relationship with her stepmother. When Henry died in 1547, he left provisions of £7,000 a year for Catherine to support herself. She married Thomas Seymour, now uncle to the new king, and Lady Elizabeth moved into their household. While there, Seymour developed an inappropriate interest in the young Elizabeth, and she eventually left their household to live elsewhere. Many suggest this early experience scarred her and had a hand in her famous vow never to marry. It was rumoured that Seymour even wanted to marry Elizabeth, a claim that was included in evidence which resulted in Seymour's eventual execution for treason, yet another noble with their head cut off. In August 1548, Catherine gave birth to her only child, yet tragically died several days later from suspected childbed fever. A Protestant funeral, the first of its kind delivered in English, was held for Catherine in the grounds of Sudley Castle, where she was laid to rest in the nearby St Mary's Chapel on the 7th of September. The final surviving wife was Anne of Cleves, who passed away in 1557, rather incredibly seeing both Edward and Mary become monarchs. The following year, Elizabeth I became queen, bringing about a golden age in English history, and she would never be a wife to anyone. So, as we bid adieu to Aragon, Boleyn, Seymour, Cleves, Howard and Parr, let us remember the undeniable mark they made on Britain's history, both as powerful queens and intriguing individuals. Thank you for watching this video, it's been a wild ride! Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for even more fascinating history, and let us know in the comments which topic you'd like to see next.